We're having baptisms following the service this morning, right outside in the, in the parking lot, and uh, that's going to be just an awesome time. How many know baptism is more than just an outward symbol of an inward change? Baptism is a line in the sand. And uh, not only are those who are choosing to take that step with Jesus this morning, not only are they professing their faith publicly in front of all of us, but they're professing their faith in the spiritual realm. And they're saying, I don't belong to that old kingdom anymore. I'm in the kingdom of Jesus. And being buried and raised with Jesus is that first step of obedience, giving our heart to him. So that's, that's an awesome, I love baptism Sundays. How about you? And today we're also celebrating our communities and everything that God did this semester. And so y'all give it up for Ashley Prather. She's going to come on up here. <laughs> Ashley is our communities director here at The Dwelling, and she has done an amazing, amazing job of giving vision and training leaders and pastoring these leaders this semester. We're so thankful for Ashley. Give her one more. We love you. And she's going she's gonna to give us a little... Uh, update and share some information with us. Yes. Yeah, I didn't want the semester to end without us just celebrating communities together as a church instead of, I didn't want to do something with just the leaders because I'm like, communities kind of belongs to all of us, you know? So anyway, I'm going to share some numbers and I just want to preface it with saying we don't care about numbers for numbers sake, but from my end, I can't be a part of every community as much as I would love to, but it's a way for me to kind of keep a pulse on the health of our community's ministry as a whole. And so the only reason we look at numbers is because numbers represent human beings. And so um, we had eight groups this semester, which is great. They were all spread out around Savannah and the surrounding areas. There were 116 people that signed up, which is so awesome. And that puts the average size at around 14 or 15, which is great. Um, this is something that I look at every semester. I look at how many people signed up and then I go through our attendance and I look at how many people actually attended because it's just a good way for me to know, Gunnar and I to know involvement. Um, so we had 116 people sign up, 106 people out of those 116 attended, which puts us at like 91, 92% involvement, which is incredible. Yeah, it's really, really high and it's... Um, I think it just shows that as a church, we value communities that highly, that when we sign up, like we show up. And I love that about our, um, our family here. We had 30 visitors. It's like the highest amount of people that have visited communities this semester. So that puts at us, us at 136 people that were involved total. And that is not including children. That's 136 adults that were involved in communities this semester. Something that I noticed that I think is a huge win is that we had some people that were visitors one week. Like I would look at the attendance and it would say, you know, three visitors or whatever at the bottom. And then the next week, the name of that visitor was a member in the group the next week, which is just so cool to see. People are visiting and being like, yeah, this is where I want to be and they'll join the group. <clears throat> so those are just some numbers. So we can all just celebrate that together. Yeah. And then I did want to share a little bit about vision. Uh... So this is a quote from a book called Messianic Church Arising, and the whole book is about just the early church. This is a quote that we go over with the community leaders during community leader training that just really, it's just an all-encompassing quote of what we're going after and what we want these communities to offer and to do in our lives and in the city. So I'm just going to read this. Once upon a time, there was a church that worked. Its members loved each other, took care of widows and orphans, fed the hungry, and transformed cities. It taught the Bible, built believers to maturity, and satisfied the longing in their hearts to touch God. This church didn't just talk about the power of God. It healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons. It won the lost with incredible effectiveness, discipled its converts, and equipped them to minister. Its effectiveness was not limited to one culture or ethnic group. It grew with explosive power wherever it was planted. This incredible church was not a myth or a fairy tale, it was real. It's documented in historical records. It was a church made up of real people with real problems, but was characterized by a life and power the world could not resist. The early church was the most powerful institution the world had ever seen. Each local church was divided into units small enough to meet weekly in homes where fellowship and ministry could take place on a personal basis. 
Although the church regularly met together in larger meetings also, the house churches provided the foundation of church activity. Even if the church grew to 20 to 30,000 members, its primary unit would still be the house church. So that's our vision and kind of what we're going after. We love and value our meetings here and what God does when we're in this place together, but we wanna create a space throughout the week where we can really walk through life together in a really genuine way and, um, and just grow in, grow in our knowledge of God and in our experience of God together. And that would just be a vision if there weren't people that got on board and carried it out and, and made it a reality and pursued it with all of their hearts and rearranged their priorities and their schedules to make a space for this to happen. And so I want to just pause and really honor the leaders that committed to this, that opened their homes for 12 weeks in a row and just poured into, poured into us, um, poured into me. So I'm going to name all of our leaders. If you're in here, stand up. If they're not in here and they're out serving, just tell them thank you today. Um, so let's honor these people. I'll read all of their names and then we can explode with thankfulness for all of them. <clears throat> okay, Dane and Christy Rada, Matt and Lauren Ionato, Micah and Alexis Mills, Rob and Savannah Driggers, Tim and Mackenzie Burnsid, Trey and Holly Barker, George and Gretchen Perez, Dan and Amanda Host, Stefan and Chantal Cote, Dorsey and Rachel West. We thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done and the spaces that you created. Um, so we are gonna take the way that we function, community groups, we do 12 week semesters and then we take an extended break period. Um, it's just a, as of right now, it's been a good rhythm for us with giving leaders a bit of rest and just reevaluate um, different seasons and things like that. So we are gonna be breaking with our community groups gathering until mid-February. Um, I don't want that to be a discouragement to anyone, even if you might be coming into the dwelling and you're like, wait, they're ending? So I just wanna say our vision for community in our family doesn't begin and end with our community's ministry. It's so much bigger than that. And so this is a really good time um, for you to, I'll just say for people who are in a community group, you had two and a half hours minimum that you were devoting to community on a weekly basis. And so I would just strongly encourage you to not let busyness eat up those hours that you had committed the past 12 weeks. Maybe make a mental commitment. I'm gonna keep devoting two, three hours a week to community. Maybe it's with people in your group that you haven't had a chance to hang out with one-on-one -on -one, or people in other groups that you wish you could spend more time with. Just pursue community. And for those of you who weren't in a community that don't know how to get involved, that greenery wall after the service is a great first step as far as getting plugged in and we can get you connected to people in your area, even if communities are not meeting at the time. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna read one more quote that's also in our community's manual. <clears throat> we are partners with him and we have an assignment to bring salt and light and life wherever we go. Then when we come together, we can be excited and encourage each other with the testimonies of how a living God touched hearts and we had the privilege of partnering with him in the process. So that's not just for our community group leaders. That's a charge for all of us. And so just, I just encourage you to pursue community during this break. Look out for groups launching. We'll probably open signups at the beginning of February and then y'all will start meeting mid-February and just be salt and light and life wherever you go. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Ashley. I want to encourage everybody um, to go to the dwellingchurch.org and click on the testimony link on there. And if the Lord moved in your life during this semester of communities, tell about it. Yeah. Tell about it. Don't hold, don't withhold the testimony. Do you know what testimony does? Creates faith for God to do the same thing he did in your life and somebody else's life. And it could be your story that someone else is able to hold on to. It's like, if they could do it for them, they can do it. God can do it for me. And so share your testimony online. I've got one right here somebody sent me 
during uh, worship when we were singing that songs about seasons. And, and even though I'm in the winter right now, and uh, some of you might be in that winter season of your life, here's what one of the leaders texted me. said, looking around at people that we've done community with and knowing the winters they've been through, watching them worship is so encouraging. And I will tell you, you don't, you don't know that stuff until you're in community, truly in community with people and in that place of vulnerability and opening your heart. And you need people to walk with you through that stuff. And it, there's nothing like community. So make sure next time community signups come around, get in one. Like Ashley said, fight for it. Like run people down <laughs> and be like, Spend time with me. Like, I, I need you in my life. And um, you just won't grow if this is all you get. I, I don't want to hurt your feelings about it. But if you're just in, in here on Sunday morning, you're not going to grow like you will if you're in true community, biblical community. And our, our goal is to become more and more biblical with our community. And we're actually going to dig into that next, uh, next year in a message series about community and launching our new community groups in February, like Ashley said. So, y'all ready to get with the word this morning? Get on with it here? All right. Somebody say, you got 15 minutes, Gunner. Y'all won't starve. All right. We've been in a series called Kings. Moments that matter. And we've been looking at the lives of some of the kings in Scripture, the kings of Israel and Judah, and just the lessons that we can learn from their lives. And um, there are moments in all of our lives where we are presented with options. And what we do in those moments determine the direction of our life, the quality of our life. And today I want to talk about family heirlooms. Family heirlooms. I've got an old painted up hammer at my house right now. And that hammer built more houses than I can count. It belonged to my Paul, my dad's father. You know, dropped out of school fifth grade. Well, that, back then that's all you needed to build houses. I'm like, I can't make an angle. I don't know how to build houses in my my granddad did it with a fifth grade education and he took that hammer and he drove nails for years and years and years with it. And I've got it and I've got it framed and it says, unless the Lord builds a house. And um, I'm just so thankful for heirlooms. Have you got some family heirlooms like that? I, I put out a, uh, a social media poll this week and I just said, what, what are the most treasured family heirlooms that you have. And I got some really good responses, everything from China, you know, dishes and things that, and it was, somebody said, it, it's something special about knowing that my grandmother touched that or that she stitched that quilt or made that quilt or did that stitching or, or drew that sketch. People, people commented and said, our family Bible and, and our Bibles of family members where they've highlighted it up and wrote notes in the, in the margins. I've got a, a Bible at my house with one of my grandparents and I was flipping through it and there was a letter that my grandmother wrote to my grandfather, like a little love note stuck in the Bible. And I just, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing because they're gone. I don't have any grandparents living any longer. And so you hold on to those things and, and um, there was cast iron skillets and old watches and wedding bands and fishing lures. There was a really special one on there. A lady commented, she said, this is my dad's Bible. He only knew the Lord intimately for six years before he died of cancer at age 36. I was eight years old. And the Bible is just marked up like crazy. Just like you could tell this, the, the spiritual hunger that that man had. And six years, the last six years of his, years of his life were spent just pursuing Jesus. And to hold that Bible... And to read the notes in those margins, that's just special, isn't it? Someone said, I've got a ton of stuff passed down to me. And the problem I have is I have a hard time knowing which ones are important enough to keep. If you've ever lost a loved one and had to do that whole thing of cleaning out and you're like, this is overwhelming because everything before my eyes is sentimental. 
Like, and if, especially if you're a sentimental person, like, I just want to hold on to this. It's valuable. I'll never, it's like, it's almost like our memories are attached to objects. And we don't want to let go of those things. And family heirlooms are really important. And there, there are certain things that pass, that get passed down to us. But how many know that they may not be rings and dishes and watches and Bibles, but there are spiritual heirlooms that are passed down to us. And so I want to talk about a king today named Asa. Now, I've got a little nephew named Asa, and he's cool. <laughs> so I like Asa. But if you look at King Asa's life, he was one of the good ones, which was a rarity. If you read the list of the kings and their history, he was the king of Judah and he was the grandson of Rehoboam. You remember Jeroboam and Rehoboam last week? Some of y'all are like, what you talking about? Last week, some of y'all were here and you're like, what you talking about? Um, <laughs> son of Rehoboam, grandson of Solomon. So we're moving on down the family tree branch here. And we read about Asa in 2 Chronicles 14. We'll start reading in verse 1. And I did not do my pronunciation search on this one. Abijah. Good enough for me. Abijah slept with his fathers. That was his dad. And they buried him in the city of David. And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. I said something wrong a while ago. Rehoboam's grandson, Solomon's great-grandson. So back it up one generation. Abijah was his father, okay? And Asa, his son, reigned in his place. In his days, the land had rest for 10 years. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherim. Now, let me tell you what the Asherim were. You, you see this word Asherim or Asherah poles. These were wooden poles or even sacred trees, almost like a totem pole. You know, you've seen with the faces and stuff on it. They were erected in honor of a goddess called Asherah. Now, these are one of the gods of the Canaanites that some of Solomon's wives brought into the, brought into the nation and were worshiping, and they were everywhere in Judah, and Asa tears them down. Okay, so good king, right? Doing some good stuff, getting out there, making it happen. And commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandments. He also took out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the incense altars. Now, just a little note about high places because I wanted to get to this in this series, but we've only got one week left. The high places were raised pieces of ground where they would build these Asherah poles or these altars on to worship false gods. And it was just a raised piece of land. And over and over throughout the Kings and Chronicles, you hear this phrase, they removed the idols, they removed the altars, but they did not remove the high places. How many know sometimes we can tear the altars down, the idols down in our life, but if we don't take care of the foundation in which those idols were built on, then we're just going to get built up on again. And whether it's us or maybe it's the next generation, that, that's what happened often in the scripture. If they didn't get rid of the high place, the next generation would just put an altar back up on it. So it's important to think generationally. It says, And the kingdom had rest under him. He built fortified cities in Judah, and the land had rest. He had no war in these years, for the Lord gave him peace. And he said to Judah, let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought our, the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us peace on every side. So they built and they prospered. And then the story continues in 2 Chronicles chapter 15. And it says, the spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa. This was a prophet. And here's what he said to Asa. Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. 
But when in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. In those times, there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in for great disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the lands. They were broken in pieces. Nation was crushed by nation and city by city for God troubled them with every sort of distress. But you take courage. Don't let your hands be weak for your work shall be rewarded. As soon as Asa heard these words, the prophecy of Azariah, the son of Oded, he took courage and he put away the detestable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities that he had taken to the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the vestibule of the house of the Lord. How many know all the other gods were getting worship, but they had to go back and repair the altar to the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those from Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon who were residing with them for great numbers had deserted to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. They were gathered in Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of the reign of Asa. They sacrificed to the Lord on that day from the spoil that they had brought 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all of their heart and with all of their soul. But that whoever would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, should be put to death, whether young or old, man or woman. And they swore an oath to the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting, with trumpets and with horns. And all Judah rejoiced over the oath, for they had sworn with all of their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found by them. And the Lord gave them rest all around. Even Makah, his mother, King Asa, removed from being queen mother because she had made a detestable image for Asherah. Asa cut down her image, crushed it, and burned it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken down out of Israel, the northern kingdom. They were taken out of, of Judah, but not the northern kingdom. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true all of his days, and he brought into the house of God the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts, silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war until the 55th year of the, the reign of Asa. There's three things I want to look at really quickly today. First of all, that man tore down his mama's idol. <laughs> chopped it down. <laughs> chopped it up and burn it and removed her from her place of influence. Don't let that just slip on by in the reading of the scriptures this morning. Sometimes there are things that are passed down to us by the generation before that we need to destroy. There are things sometimes not... Not necessarily watches and hammers and family Bibles, but some spiritual heirlooms that are passed down to us that have no business being in our lives. And there needs to be an end to it. It needs to be cut off. It needs to be cut down, chopped up. And it takes action. It takes action. There are some things we're like, well, I just need some prayer because I got this stuff going on in my life and Blah, blah, blah. I need, I need deli God deliver me. God deliver me. But yet we're holding on to it. And we're asking for deliverance when we won't let go of what we don't need to have in our life. He does not violate our will. We cannot be set free of what we love so dearly we can't let go of. But there's some things that must be chopped down, broken off of your life. And sometimes we have to be violent with it. There was a moment in my life where I was in the shower one day. Why is it that God speaks in the shower all the time? Maybe I won't shut up and be quiet long enough to hear him until I'm in the, in the shower. Yes, I think that's true. But I was at a really low place in my life. And I just had a flash of picture in my mind of a 
a Christian therapist, a counselor. And uh, some of y'all are so spiritual that you don't think that's valuable. But how many know sometimes instead of just sitting around and praying and hoping that God delivers you, sometimes you've got to actually do something about it and get on the phone and call somebody. Get on the phone and call somebody and say, will you pray for me? Get on the phone and make your, make your appointment. Sometimes some of us might be stuck in some kind of addiction and we're just like, God, deliver me. God, deliver me. God, deliver me. And you've been praying that for six years. And you might be drinking too much. How many know it's going to take a line in the sand to stop? It's going to have to be what Asa did. says, no, this idol cannot remain in my life any longer. And let me just give you so a truth that you might not even believe right now. Addictions can be broken. Yeah. Addictions can be broken. And if you're struggling with something that won't let go of you, I promise you, you can find freedom in Christ. I promise. But it's going to take you doing something, not just wishful thinking. It has to be a violent oppositional action to what needs to be broken in our life. The spirit of religion, that's what I had to learn with the spirit of religion in my life. It wasn't something I could just let fall off of me over time. It's something I had to take drastic measures to stop its influence in my life, to reject what I had, what I had picked up along the way, whether it's, I was taught some of this stuff or not, or whether it just picked up of just this prideful attitude of self-righteousness, this view of God that was nothing like who he actually was. And I had to chop that thing down and burn it. I wonder what it is that you need to part with today that was passed down to you. The second thing I saw in this passage is not only did he chop his mama's idols down, but it says he brought his father's gifts into God's house. Some spiritual heirlooms are meant to be kept. Some of them need to go in the fire. And some of them need to be held close. And we must be careful not to toss out everything passed down to us, lest we trash a treasure. And in our generation currently of deconstruction and all this kind of stuff, I'm all for actually getting down to the roots of what we actually believe and walking in it. But if we throw away what's passed down to us that's actually good, we're trashing a treasure. Yeah. And some things that are passed down to us are meant to be held on to. Legacy is biblical. Legacy is a kingdom thing. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 40, 41, said the one who receives a prophet because he's a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Receive a righteous person because he's a righteous person. He will receive the reward of the righteous. I don't know how all this works but I believe that when we honor those who've gone before us and have actually carried and sacrificed and carried something that God put in their life, when we honor what God did in their life and when we honor what we, they carried, we actually get to get in on that. And that what the last generation built as a foundation, we get to build on top of and go further than they did. Do you know that that's the whole point of legacy? It's not just to repeat the former generation's successes or failures is to actually build on what they built with God. So I wonder, who, who's seen the, uh, I don't know if it was the, the Oscars or something, and, and, and um, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, came up on there and his acceptance speech of the award, many of you have seen this, floating around on the internet, is he said, we all have people that have made an impact in our lives. And this was his speech. Why don't we take a few moments and remember those people and the, what they did for us? 
And then there was like complete silence. And the camera goes to the audience and people are like crying like, because <laughs> people's influence in our life really matter. Yeah. And, and I wonder even, even right now, who has impacted your life in eternal ways? Just let some of those faces begin to pop up in your mind right now. Spiritual leaders. Maybe it was a grandmama that, like mine, woke up at three in the morning praying for me and she'd tell me about it. Who has made an impact in your life and how are you honoring that legacy? You say, well, they're long gone. I can't honor them anymore. Yeah, you can. You can tell their story. You can actually do what they did for somebody else. You can honor that legacy, honor that testimony. I wrote this in my notes. We don't cancel our fathers for their sins. We learn from them. Some of you look back over your family line and you think, I don't, I don't see anything I want to bring into the, the next generation. I don't see anything I want to hold on to. But how many know we can learn from the mistakes and by the grace of God move forward and not walk the way they did? But if we honor what they did carry well, we get to build on it. So what are the spiritual heirlooms you're grateful for and need to hold on to? Real question. I want you to be answering this inside your head, okay? Which ones do you need to cast out, burn down? Which ones do you need to carry with you, hold on to? And then the last thing I see is it says that Asa brought his own gifts into God's house. Spiritual heirlooms must be owned to be passed down. I mean, you know, you can't... You can't just show up at somebody's house. It's got a tractor out there in the barn or something. Listen, the Alabama's coming out in me right now. <laughs> got a tractor out in the barn. You can't just walk up to a stranger's house and say, hey, would you like to have this guy's tractor? Go ahead and get it. <laughs> no, it's not your tractor. You can't give away something you don't have. You can't, you can't pass down what you don't own. We cannot live off the blessing or gifting of a former generation. We cannot expect the sacrifices of those who came before us to sustain the movement forward that we've been called to. We can't complain when the world is going like it does if we're not willing to invest in the generation that's coming after us. There's a lot of negative things being said about Gen Z. Guess what? They said it about the millennials. They said it about Generation X. I don't even know who was before that. Boomers. I wonder if there'd be some people in this generation that wouldn't demonize the next, but actually look for ways to invest in that generation. Rather than just writing them off and say, oh, Lord, look what the world's coming to. Actually being, taking action, being aggressive about reaching the next generation. I used to think about this. Uh, we, we grew up with Keith Green, the worship leader back in the, I don't know when that was, but we were still listening to his music in my youth group. And he said this, he said, this generation on the earth is responsible for this generation of souls. And I just remember being totally overwhelmed by that statement. Like it's all on me. What does that even look like? What does that even mean? And like, how do you reach a generation? Who else is not overwhelmed by that? Like, I'm just like, I, I don't know what, the, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to reach a generation. You know where it starts? It starts with your own kids. It just starts by being there. It starts by teaching them what you know about Jesus. You may not have the perfect walk with Jesus, but you can teach them what you do have. You can model what you do have. And guess what? They're watching. They may be sounding like they're writing you off, but they're listening and they're watching. I had an older man in my life, a mentor in my life. I talked to him this week. And he said, um, you know, how's family going and all that? And I was like, well, I'm kind of had to say I'm sorry a couple times this week. <laughs> and, he, uh, and he said, you know what? My, my grown children came to me a couple weeks ago and they, they sat down with me and their mom and they said, we are so thankful that you 
said you were sorry growing up. And that we heard you say, this is what I'm was this is what I did wrong. I was wrong. Do your children ever hear you say, I was wrong? I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? That does not bring your authority level down. That actually gives you greater authority in their lives, greater influence in their lives. And, and they said, they said, Mom and Dad, we're so grateful that you were honest about your own shortcomings because it helps us so much to live our own life. And now that we're setting up our own life and that's starting our own families. We got a really good foundation just because you were real. You didn't try to be perfect, but you were honest. And you said, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? How do you reach a next generation? By starting with your generation that's in your own house. How do you reach a next generation? It's just simple steps. It's small things. It, it may be signing up, teaming up with the kids team on Sundays. I can't tell you how Amazing it is to sit down with a, a little seven-year-old or six-year-old that understands the kingdom sometimes more than we do and has more faith than we do. It may not be that you're pouring into the next generations as much as the next generation is pouring into you, but, but I'm telling you, it'll add value to your life and you'll add value to theirs. We have a youth group around here. I, I remember growing up, there were people and they weren't our youth leaders. They weren't our, they weren't on staff at the church or anything, but they'd come up and they'd say, hey, I got a pool yeah. at my house. Yeah. Bring the youth over. Yeah. Have a pool party. Hey, we got a big basement down here with a pool table in it. And anytime y'all want to come hang out, our house is open for the teenagers. Yeah. Who opens their house to teenagers? Those who care about the next generation. And it's just a little, it's just, that's just a weekend. It just starts with little things. Just little steps. How do you reach a generation? By just making yourself available. By making, taking little steps to reach them. We have so many college students in our city. We have the greatest opportunity in the world. We've got Georgia Southern. We've got SCAD. We've got Savannah State. We got, all, we got other, I don't even know how many colleges we got in this town. Yeah. But I believe we have a responsibility for them. Yeah. How do you reach a campus? One student at a time. Yeah, if you see a scat, where am I? If I got any scat students in here this morning, I'm going to embarrass you. <laughs> any college students at all? Lift your hands up. See? They should be, we should be full of SCAD right now. Yeah. Full. Yeah. How do we do that? I don't know. But the Lord does. Yeah. And it's going to take not this grand vision from a platform of how to reach SCAD and Georgia Southern and all those college kids in this town. It's going to take a vision that's put in your heart for what you can do, for what I can do. And when we do see them coming through these doors, grab them. I told somebody this morning, yeah, just grab me, not hard. Like, <laughs> Don't grab them hard, but bring them in. Encourage these teenagers around here. Encourage these youth leaders, Leah and the rest. Encourage these kids' team. Because they're the ones that's pouring, they're pouring into the, the next generation. Don't you think they need some encouragement? Because sometimes, especially in youth ministry, and I'm sure it's this way in kids' ministry too, you don't always see immediate fruit. It's like we sang about this morning. It takes a lot of time to see the fruit. And so those who are pouring into those generations... They need encouragement. They need, to, they need to hear those promises. They need to hear the testimonies about the people who poured into you when you were that age. So I wonder, what are the things that you can offer the Lord? What are the things that you need to chop down and burn up? What are the things that you need to hold on to? And then what are the things you need to release and invest in the next generation? So y'all know this about me. 
if you've been around here a while, if you are in a coffee shop anywhere and you see me there and I don't have AirPods in my ears, I'm listening to you, okay? I cannot concentrate on what I'm doing if you're having a conversation right next to me. And I will waste an hour listening to what you're saying with your best friend, talking about your husband. Listen, I know everybody's story in the coffee shops I go in. You are not safe. <laughs> and then I realize, what am I doing? I put, my, I put these things in, put on some like music or something. And uh, I was in a coffee shop early last week, and uh, there was an, about an 80 or 90-year-old woman sitting at a table with her grown son. And, um, and they were talking about Christmas. And you could tell that the son was from out of town, and he was visiting his mom. And they were talking about who wasn't coming to Christmas this year and why. Of course, I'm... Just listening to all of it. I'm sorry. I can't help it. It's just people are intriguing to me. And, um, and then, of course, the conversation went not just to their family and how their family seems to be pulling away and deteriorating, and it's a communication thing, and it's technology. And it seems like to me it's technology is getting better and better the more connected we would be, but it seems to be having the opposite effect, and they're pining the deterioration of family in this generation. And the son says, I can only imagine what family connection will be like in 2050. And the old woman said, I won't be here. <laughs> then I put my AirPods in. I'm like. <laughs> but what she said stuck with me. And I don't think she meant it in a negative way. She's just stating a fact. Like, I'm not going to be here in 2050. But often that's the, that's the attitude we have about the next generation and what's coming after us. And we say, well, I'm not going to be here. What does it matter? This doesn't concern me. I mean, best of luck to you. Don't look like it's going real well right now, you know. But at least I'm getting on out of here, you know. Like, no, we can't think that way, especially in the body of Christ. So what spiritual heirlooms are you leaving your children? What spiritual heirlooms are you leaving the next generation? Because it really does matter. And the truth is, we're leaving a legacy whether we are intentional about it or not. We could either leave a good legacy, a godly legacy, or we can leave an ungodly legacy, a bad one. Let's leave a good one. Let's stand and pray this morning. Father, we don't take lightly the call to forsake idols. We don't take lightly your call on our lives to hold tight to the things that have been passed down to us. And Lord, we will not be flippant about what you're calling us to invest into the next generation. If he's spoken to your heart this morning about any of those three things, just right now, I want you to make a commitment to the Lord. And then before the sun sets this evening, I want you to tell somebody about what you committed this morning to the Lord, whether it was to get rid of something passed down to you or to hold on some, to something passed down or to pass it down yourself. So tell the Lord what that is. Tell someone today what that thing is. And then do it. Sound good? Okay. Okay. Well, God bless you. <laughs> Go do it then. That's our, that's our altar call today. 
because what matters more is what we do when we leave this place. So let's be obedient. God bless you guys in Jesus' name. Having baptism right after service.